This is the story of Harry Houdini, the most renowned escapologist in the world. The narrative unfolds through the eyes of Benji, a young girl whose life, alongside her mother Mary, changes when Houdini tours Scotland in 1926. The film commences with a captivating scene. Harry, bound in chains, teeters on the edge of a bridge before plunging into the river below. Benji, our insightful narrator, introduces herself, explaining her unique ability to perceive what others cannot a gift that will eventually fade away. She possesses an acute sense of uncovering deceit, particularly within the realm of illusion and trickery. As Harry descends into the water, encased in chains with seemingly no means of escape, Benji observes his calm demeanor amidst the perilous situation. Despite the frantic concern of onlookers, Harry remains unperturbed, his confidence unwavering. He floats effortlessly, defying the odds. Anxiety grips the watching crowd, especially Mr. Sugarman, who anxiously prays that Harry will not subject him to such nerve-wracking spectacles again, fearing for his safety. Meanwhile, anticipation mounts among the eager audience, eager to witness the unfolding spectacle. At the behest of the Mr. Sugarman, the men spring into action, swiftly hoisting Harry from the depths, fearing he may not resurface. With a flourish, Harry reveals himself, having successfully liberated himself from his aquatic prison, chains dangling triumphantly as proof of his escapade. The crowd erupts into applause, their expectations fulfilled, and their admiration for Harry's skill amplified. Throughout this captivating portrayal, Benji's keen observations, and the seamless interplay of suspense and revelation draw viewers deeper into the mesmerizing world of Harry Houdini's escapades. Benji continues her narration, likening Houdini to a deity revered by the Greeks, a notion she's gleaned from her comics. Despite her admiration for Houdini's larger-than-life persona, she contrasts his seemingly luxurious existence with her own reality of poverty. While Houdini enjoys comfort elsewhere, Benji and her mother Mary eke out a living together, performing as a double act. Their day begins amidst the bleak backdrop of the slums, where Benji and Mary unleash their frustrations with colorful curses aimed at the denizens of their harsh environment. With Benji's keen eye scanning for potential marks, they eventually spot their quarry near the pawn shop. An old man, drawn in by the allure of violets sold by Benji, becomes unwitting prey as she deftly pilfers his pocket watch before vanishing into the bustling streets. Returning to her mother's side, Benji shows her the spoils of their endeavor, believing it to be sufficient for their needs. However, upon inspection, they discover an unexpected inscription on the watch. In a heartfelt moment, Benji reflects on her mother's resilience, crediting her for their survival in a world marked by cruelty. Grateful for Mary's unwavering strength, Benji realizes the depth of their bond and the sacrifices her mother has made for their well-being. Mary, seizing upon an opportunity, takes the watch to a records keeper, weaving a tale of familial connection to the old man. Employing subtle charm and guile, Mary persuades the record keeper to grant her access to the couple's records, setting the stage for a clandestine investigation into the watch's origins. Later, at a bustling tavern, patrons revel in entertainment provided to them. As the atmosphere buzzes with energy, Mary emerges, transforming into an exotic dancer, captivating the audience with her mesmerizing belly dance. Joining her in the performance is none other than her daughter Benji, disguised as an Indian boy with a carefully applied brown face, ready to play their roles as cunning con artists. With Benji's assistance, Mary begins her act, utilizing the information they've gathered to pinpoint potential targets in the crowd. Engaging with one of the guests, Mary playfully jests about a woman named Rose, humorously guessing the color of her undergarments. As the performance progresses, Benji discreetly alerts Mary to their next mark, Charles, strategically weaving the narrative around his deceased wife, Violet. Drawing Charles into the spectacle, Mary skillfully employs the power of suggestion, subtly manipulating his belief that she is communing with his departed spouse. Charles, deeply moved, succumbs to Mary's persuasion, divulging details about Violet's passing, validating her supposed connection to the spirit world. Seizing the moment, Mary further probes Charles, insinuating knowledge of his missing pocket watch. With Benji's assistance, Mary orchestrates a theatrical display, purportedly summoning the watch with a mock ritual. Despite Charles's belief in the supernatural charade, Mary deftly returns the watch, claiming to have divined its inscription through her psychic abilities. Unbeknownst to Charles, the entire spectacle is a carefully orchestrated ruse, with Mary and Benji manipulating his emotions for their own gain. Mary and Benji make their exit, leaving Charles bewildered in their wake. They reside in a graveyard, their home now that the theater has long been closed. Despite their unconventional living situation, Mary holds reservations about Benji's fondness for comics, a reminder of her father, 
whom she characterizes as someone only interested in fun, with Benji as the consequence of that enjoyment. Benji, however, is a big fan of Houdini. The mother-daughter duo goes to a silent film screening featuring Houdini, where Benji's idolization of the escape artist is on full display. The newsreel shows Houdini's life and his relationship with his mother. Throughout the film, the relationship between Mary and Benji is subtly portrayed, showing a deep connection rooted in love and companionship. Though Mary sees Benji more as a colleague than a daughter, their bond remains strong. Benji eagerly reads the movie cards, thrilled to discover Houdini's $10,000 offer to decipher his mother's final words. The news of Houdini's impending arrival in Edinburgh, where they live, fills Benji with hope and excitement, both at seeing Houdini and getting the money. As Harry Houdini arrives in Edinburgh with Mr. Sugarman and their group, it's clear he carries unresolved past trauma. Despite this, he's warmly welcomed by fans and quickly captivates them with his dazzling performances. Even though Houdini has been to Scotland before, his presence still garners significant attention. In interviews, he passionately discusses his mission to expose fraudulent paranormal practitioners. Houdini accepts a challenge from a member of the crowd to endure a punch to the face. Despite objections from his guards and sugarmen, he stands his ground, allowing the challenger space to deliver the blow. The atmosphere crackles with anticipation as the boxer winds up for the punch, everyone holding their breath. When the blow finally lands, Houdini barely flinches, leaving the crowd in awe of his legendary endurance. Among them, Benji watches in wide-eyed wonder, seeing her idol's seemingly supernatural resilience, yet also sensing a darker undertone lurking beneath his bravado. Aside, Mr. Sugarman struggles to keep in check. Amidst the commotion, Mr. Sugarman discreetly slips a few dollars to the bellboys, who gratefully scurry off. But as the spectacle winds down, Houdini's facade crumbles, his demeanor shifting to one of discomfort and irritation. He quickly retreats to the restroom, the strain of the punch evident on his face. Removing a girdle that softened the impact, he spits blood, revealing the toll the challenger's blow took on him. Despite Houdini's reassurances to Mr. Sugarman, the latter remains anxious. Houdini insists he can still perform his tricks. Meanwhile, Mary is occupied with researching Houdini's intricate bond with his late mother. She discovers his deep involvement in spiritualism and his staunch opposition to its practitioners. Viewing him as intensely private, Mary suspects his fixation on his mother stems from unresolved grief. The record's keeper, who seems to have a thing for her, sneaks behind and surprises her. In a rush, she snatches a page of information before slipping away unnoticed. Meanwhile, Houdini, still feeling the effects of the punch, reads letters from people claiming psychic powers, keen to challenge his doubts. He shares with Mr. Sugarman his wish to focus on science and debunking myths, instead of showy escapades. Yet, as Houdini receives letters from American scientists, Mr. Sugarman reminds him of the financial needs of show business, stressing profits over science. At night, Mary takes on the role of the mistress of the sky, on a whim, surprising Benji with her ability to slip into different personas effortlessly. Later, at the hotel, Mary's presence without permission makes the staff suspicious, and the bellboys chase her. Managing to escape, Mary disguises herself as a maid, running into Houdini and Mr. Sugarman. She takes advantage of the situation to enter their room and starts looking for information. In a surprising moment, Houdini spots a framed photo of a woman labeled as his little darling wife, sparking his curiosity and possibly stirring up emotions he had kept hidden. Meanwhile, in the theater, Benji, inspired by her idol, decides to play around with makeup in Houdini's dressing room, a playful act that could get her into trouble. Later, Mr. Sugarman and Houdini catch Benji going through their things. While Sugarman moves to kick her out, Houdini steps in, sensing no ill intent in Benji's actions, and tells Sugarman to leave her alone, seeing her as harmless. In a lighthearted exchange, Benji showcases her talent for mimicking American accents, eliciting amusement from Houdini. Embracing the playful atmosphere, Houdini engages with Benji, extending an offer of hospitality in the form of a sandwich and jovial conversation. Curious about Benji's background, Houdini inquires about her skills and potential as an opening act. Benji, seizing the opportunity, offers herself as a disciple of a psychic, claiming her mother is a spiritual medium. Impressed by Benji's earnestness, Houdini grants her a free ticket to his show. However, before Benji can fully convince Houdini of her mother's psychic prowess, Sugarman interrupts, forcefully ushering her out of the room. Despite the interruption, Benji's encounter with Houdini leaves her with a newfound sense of excitement and possibility. 
as she eagerly anticipates attending his show. The show commences with Houdini poised beside an aquarium, wearing a robe. He then handcuffs himself and starts to submerge into the water. As the aquarium seals shut, anxiety fills the air, with Benji, seated in the front row, fixated on Houdini's every move. Houdini's trick unfolds as he deftly releases a key from his mouth, unlocking his handcuffs while briefly obscuring the aquarium from view. However, amidst the illusion, Houdini is momentarily distracted by a hallucination of his mother, disrupting his focus as he grapples to locate the key. Concern mounts among the audience, and Sugarman, fearing for Houdini's safety during the prolonged ordeal. Yet, as the curtains rise, Houdini is sitting comfortably atop the aquarium, freed and unharmed, much to Sugarman's relief. However, Sugarman cautions Houdini against pushing his luck with such risky stunts in the future. Returning home from the show, Benji excitedly shares her joy with Mary, recounting Houdini's remarkable performance. However, Mary's response is far from enthusiastic, expressing disappointment in Benji's recklessness and reminding her of the cardinal rule, never get caught. Amidst their conversation, Mary reveals her frustration with their impoverished existence, lamenting their destitute circumstances. Searching for clues in Houdini's hotel room, Mary discovers little of personal significance, except a trunk that has all the answers inside. She also finds the stolen page from the records, a photograph of Houdini's deceased mother, adding to their intrigue. As they sit down to a modest dinner of tea, Mary and Benji begin to formulate their next move, their minds swirling with possibilities. In the following days, Houdini rigorously vets all the psychics who claim to decipher his mother's final words. The first candidate, a puppeteer, fails miserably, as Houdini's mother spoke German, not Hungarian. Next up is a tap dancer, followed by a pair of twins performing Macbeth. Despite their theatrical performance, Sugarman scolds them, but the twins leave an eerie remark that catches Houdini's attention, suggesting his mother will never forgive him. Later, Benji joins Mary for the psychic interview. Mary puts on a calm and charming demeanor, a departure from her usual self. Eventually, she comes clean, admitting that she pretends to have psychic abilities to make ends meet as a hardworking mother. Houdini takes notice of this, especially when Mary claims to have dreamt about his mother. Sugarman quickly figures out that Mary must have read about it in the newspaper, a fact Mary doesn't deny. Despite this, Mary continues with her psychic act, nearly fainting at one point, only to be caught by Houdini. Impressed by Mary's performance, Houdini decides she's the perfect addition to their act, naming her the Scottish woman medium. Another ad plays, promoting their new venture. Although Sugarman has doubts about hiring Mary, Houdini is firm in his decision. Houdini announces his psychic experiment to investigate the afterlife, while Sugarman unveils the envelope containing Houdini's mother's last words, kept secret until now. The envelope will be kept safe at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Meanwhile, Benji and Mary are in a fancy hotel room. Benji enjoys the luxury, but Mary feels uneasy, thinking things are too good to be true and questioning Houdini's intentions. Despite her doubts, Mary is determined to uncover the truth. Later, Mary receives a telegram inviting her to lunch, but she's suspicious of Houdini's intentions. Irritated by Benji's skipping, Mary scolds her, before the scene shifts to Benji observing monkeys in a cage. Sugarman stops her from watching the animals do something natural. Meanwhile, Mary arrives at a fancy restaurant, dressed to the nines. Houdini awaits anxiously, ensuring Mary's comfort in the intimate setting and presenting her with flowers. Mary questions if this is part of the audition, but Houdini insists she sits down first. They check the menu, but Mary says she doesn't get it, as Houdini suggests they both choose high numbers and Mary follows suit, picking out bread. Houdini orders champagne for Mary and introduces himself, sharing his origins from Wisconsin and presenting her with a pair of luxurious earrings. Despite his attempts to put them on her, Mary rebuffs him, expressing her disinterest in material wealth and bluntly asking what he truly wants. Houdini, however, insists on treating her like a proper lady and reassures her of her significance. Later, Benji excitedly tells Mary about her adventures with Mr. Sugarman. Mary brushes off their playful banter and leaves. Houdini wants to follow Mary, but is stopped by Mr. Sugarman, who warns him about the press. Later, Houdini dreams of Mary in a wedding dress, but is woken up by Sugarman. They have a busy day ahead, including appointments with a locksmith and an orphanage. While in the lift, Houdini sees Benji rushing away. She tells Mary that Houdini won't be back soon. Houdini catches Benji and Mary in his room. He gives Mary the key to a trunk, but she hesitates to take it. 
disappointed. Houdini feels let down by Mary. Embarrassed. Mary tries to explain that she needed a personal item for her psychic act. But Houdini sees through her and calls out her deception. In a final attempt, Mary pretends to cry, prompting Houdini to offer her a handkerchief. Using this moment, Mary questions Houdini's beliefs. Unfazed, Houdini shares his skepticism about psychics, revealing his encounters with many frauds who exploit people's grief. Mary realizes that dollar ten thousand means little to Houdini compared to his past poverty. As Houdini talks about missing his old life, Mary suggests they go to a tavern for a night out. Meanwhile, Benji is left alone as Houdini and Mary grow closer. At the tavern, they share stories and magic tricks. Houdini opens up about practicing magic for hours and reminisces about his childhood with his mother, showing a vulnerable side. When a fan asks for an autograph, Houdini declines. Discussing parenthood, Houdini remarks on Mary's luck with Benji, but Mary corrects him, noting his lack of children. Nonetheless, Houdini admires Mary's dedication to Benji. An unintentionally intimate moment occurs when Houdini touches Mary's hand, leaving their relationship hanging between romance and awkwardness. Despite Mary's attempts to push him away, warning him against getting involved with someone like her, Houdini remains determined. Meanwhile, Sugarman frets as the theater fills up, while Mary, Benji, and Houdini race across the grass, their laughter sounding like that of a family. They arrive at an old church, where Houdini picks the lock to get inside. As Mary warns Benji from the veranda to prevent her from falling, they both marvel at the scene. Then, Houdini climbs onto a protruding piece of the building, declaring his intention to jump without safety gear. As Houdini attempts the jump, Mary is startled and fearful. Despite her hesitation, she joins him on the ledge, their faces close, tension rising between them. Just as they almost kiss, Benji watches, but the moment ends abruptly. Executing the jump, Houdini creates the illusion of falling by swiftly descending a step. Meanwhile, the crowd grows angrier at Houdini's absence from the show. Sugarman is forced to announce and refund all ticket money. While playing around the theater, Benji reaches out to touch the water in the aquarium. Encouraging herself to take a closer look, she calls it a gift. Suddenly, she dips her hand in and plunges down. In her descent, she sees hallucinations of a red-haired woman coming for her, and an illusion of Mary and Houdini together. However, neither come to her aid as she screams for help, finding Mary indifferent to her cries. Suddenly, Benji wakes up, wrapped in a blanket, realizing it was all a nightmare. Mary is still awake by the balcony, tending to Benji. When asked about Harry's whereabouts, Mary cryptically replies that he's a gentleman and brushes it off. Mary suggests they may not need to retrieve the key anymore to complete their con mission. However, Benji reminds her of their primary goal, the money, not frivolous adventures under the sun. She admits feeling left out and ignored because of her mother's newfound love. Mr. Sugarman, furious at Houdini for the bad publicity generated by the psychic experiment, expresses concern that it's distracting him from his priorities, even reminding him of his wife's persistent calls. Despite Sugarman's warnings, Houdini remains obstinate, prompting Sugarman to threaten resignation. However, Houdini persuades him to stay, reassuring him that he'll refocus. Meanwhile, Benji sneaks around the room, while Houdini is tied in a straitjacket, but hides when Sugarman exits. Reflecting on their respective roles in keeping Mary and Houdini in line, Benji realizes Houdini's feelings of love. Benji attempts to steal the key hanging by, while Houdini struggles with a straitjacket. Houdini frees himself, and so Benji fails to steal it. Houdini, however, still feels the pain from his gut. Sugarman pays a visit to Mary, warning her of Houdini's marital status and offering her money to disappear. Despite the temptation, Mary refuses, determined to prove herself in the challenge. Dismissing Sugarman's concerns, Mary asserts her intention to go dancing with Houdini, confident in their future together. Benji and Mary arrive at the nearly empty dancing hall, accompanied only by musicians. Houdini pulls Mary onto the dance floor, while Benji pairs up with Sugarman. As they dance, Mary and Houdini continue their conversation, while Sugarman and Benji watch on, exchanging their opinions about the pair. Sugarman hints at Houdini's erratic behavior since his mother's passing, but Benji insists it's not madness, but rather love. Mary questions why Houdini hasn't asked about her marital status, still being referred to as Mrs. McGarvey. As the dance transitions into a tango, Mary broaches the topic of Houdini's wife. However, Houdini dismisses it, claiming he can do as he pleases. Feeling the intensity of the moment, Mary steps away, prompting Benji to follow suit. 
As Benji attempts to leave, Sugarman urges her to stay and discreetly passes her something. Benji catches up with Mary, revealing that Sugarman seems to be on their side, presenting the key he gave her. Mary unlocks the trunk, discovering a photo of Houdini's mother's wedding picture. Benji is surprised that she eerily like Mary. Surprisingly, Sugarman confirms the resemblance, speaking up from behind them. Sugarman reveals that Houdini was touring for his show when his mother was sick, in fact, never hearing her last words. Despite convincing the public that he was there to comfort his mother, Houdini carries immense guilt for not being there in her final moments. Mary challenges Sugarman, insisting they need to find out the truth to secure their future, determined to stay and claim the $10,000 prize. At last, Houdini's secrets are out in the open. As the show begins, they anxiously wait to see what Mary will do about it. They prepare by laying out the mother's wedding dress for Mary to wear, to channel psychic energy. Mary realizes that Houdini is not really in love with her, but just sees his mother through her. The American psychic is there to evaluate paranormal incidents through scientific boundaries. Houdini starts his show, televised by newsreels, and begins his speech, informing the public that the last words will finally be revealed. Mary walks the aisle in the wedding dress, while Benji contemplates whether what Houdini sees is an angel or if he sees his mother. Mary is shackled in leather belt restraints on the chair as she begins her act. Houdini asks his mother through Mary to take in the spirit of the mother. Mary, however, unrestrains herself and walks away, saying she can't take his money. However, as she walks out, Benji begins to convulse. The lights suddenly flicker, and then Benji speaks in Kaddish, some kind of Jewish language, and suddenly calls Houdini Eri, the name his mother fondly calls him. Houdini speaks to her in mixed German, and Benji responds in the same language. Houdini cries beside Benji as she faints, signaling that Houdini's mother has left her body. However, Benji tells Houdini that the angel with red hair waits for him, the image she saw while drowning in the aquarium. Benji faints again, and Mary attends to her. The scientist takes the paper, and it is revealed to be blank. There are no words. The crowds of press are shouting questions about what it means. Houdini admits that it is his eternal shame, as he is racked with too much guilt. Houdini runs away and steps to the edge of the balcony, attempting to jump. Mary has received the prize money. Houdini visits Mary in the cottage where she stays now with Benji. Mary, though, is mad because he makes her believe that he is in love with her. Houdini, though, asks if Mary has ever felt love for him. Houdini affirms his love for Mary, not only because she resembles his mom, but because he loves her for her. They kiss and make love. Benji, though, wonders why Houdini has never asked about Benji's fit, whether it was real or staged. But it turns out he just believed her. Houdini is leaving for Montreal for good, without leaving a promise to Mary. Houdini, though, thanks Mary for saving him. But Mary says Houdini has saved her instead. Benji, though, is sad at Houdini's departure. But Houdini promises he'll see her again. Sugarman and Houdini leave the graveyard cottage. Benji, back in Edinburgh, becomes sensational, known as a medium, following Mary's footsteps. However, coincidentally, they are looking at the same clock. Back in Montreal, he is mobbed by the press suddenly. A red-haired prankster, the same person who appeared in Benji's vision, punches him in the gut. The punching makes his appendix rupture. Mr. Sugarman apologizes to Houdini, admitting that he told Mary and Benji the truth. Houdini says he knows, and doesn't much think of it. Then, after that, he passes away. Benji watches the newsreel about what has happened to Houdini, and she cries. Benji ends her narration by saying Houdini changed their love, but they also have taught Houdini how to love. The end credits show that Houdini's last wish is for a seance to be held for his anniversaries, and that if he could, he will return to life.